Hi, welcome to Sesame Studios in our broadcast of Six Degrees of Smart Manufacturing. I am Conrad Leva. I'm Mike Yost. And in this series, we cover different perspectives and topics on smart manufacturing from the many points of view of manufacturers, practitioners, engineers, academia, integrators, the many people involved in the smart manufacturing journey. Today, we're having a 20-minute chat with two guests, Haresh Malkani and Sergio Bukovic. You can use the Q&A to send us questions. However, we might answer some of these questions later on at our LinkedIn uh, Smart Manufacturing uh, group. We will give you that link at the end of the show. So just quickly before we bring our guests on, uh, a little bit of background. If you're new to Sesame or new to our webinar series, people ask us, why are we talking about six degrees of smart manufacturing? And it ties to the concept of six degrees of separation, which is the idea that we're all only six or fewer social connections away from knowing everybody on the planet. And as we work to democratize the knowledge to make smart manufacturing a reality, um, we believe that by getting people connected um, as socially as possible, that um, we are not that far away from having the knowledge we need accessible to make smart manufacturing a reality. So as Conrad said, we use this form factor, use this format to uh, bring guests on and get their opinions. And uh, so uh, with that, we want to uh, bring our, uh, our panelists, our, our guests on today as um, Conrad had already said, Haresh Malkani is our Chief Technology Officer here at Sesame. And uh, when he, prior to joining Sesame, he um, uh, worked at Alcoa and um, um, Arconic, uh, and he worked with Sergio. And um, so Sergio is, is currently the Vice President of Data Science, but um, prior to that, he worked, as I mentioned, with Haresh, uh, also worked at GE and at um, uh, Brazilian um, aerospace OEM um, Embraer. And uh, so he's been at the forefront of uh, digital technologies and um, from the uh, design optimization all the way through smart manufacturing. And so as we raise this topic up internally, Haresh said, I got the right guy to, uh, to bring on here and join us for this conversation. So welcome Haresh and welcome Sergio. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. You know, I want to start um, today w with Haresh, but um, I there's so much hype about AI, machine learning, and changing everything about manufacturing. Analysts say that manufacturers can increase quality by 35%, double their cash flow. In the next two years, 20 to 30% of manufacturers will, will totally rely on machine learning for automation. I'm a little skeptical about those projections. However, Harez, recently your, your technical team did a great webcast on machine learning. Um, we can get that, people, please go to sesame.org to get that link. But I, I would like you to pivot on that conversation and give us some good examples of, of, of how machine learning is, is part of this smart manufacturing um, equation here? Yeah, sure, Conrad. I think it's a, it's a great question. And again, I welcome everyone to the, to the webinar. I think this topic of machine learning is sort of so, so hot right now that, uh, that the tendency is to think that machine learning is like a silver bullet to everything. And the way I look at it, uh, machine learning and, and the related technologies is it's one piece of the puzzle um, uh, and we've articulated that within SESME uh, with this particular diagram, which some of you have, have uh, perhaps seen. But if you look at the manufacturing process at the very bottom of this slide, you know, in order for us to leverage data and information, there is a, there is a, a, a route that, that um, uh, data has to take, right? You have to first have the sensors to get the data. You have to contextualize that data, make it useful as information. And then you can let loose a lot of these modern tools and techniques that are in advanced analytics and machine learning and, and both physics-based and data-driven modeling in order to obtain some intelligence and some insights that can be fed back into the process, either through a human being or through machines. 
So I see machine learning as being on that top right-hand side of this, uh, this picture, where we talk about utilizing the information, developing the insights, developing the intelligence. So it, it is one part of the ecosystem, not just a silver bullet. Well, and, and one thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to make sure that this was a, we were getting practical perspectives on this as it applies, as Conrad just talked about, um, you know, having at least a, a skeptic, healthy skepticism about uh, how this practically applies. And so from, a, from, a, um, from my perspective, you know, I've spent you know, two and a half decades in this space and, and a good bit of the time has been spent watching how manufacturing folks have struggled to work with IT people right and so now we're to a point where we are saying okay do the manufacturing people have to listen to data scientists and if so how do we do that so i know sergio you have experience with that sort of being that guy um in in your uh, in your past so maybe if you could just touch on that a little bit absolutely and i'm thanking everyone for the invitation to be here today i believe that the best way to answer that question is to take a step back and ask ourselves what is that that we want to do and that is most important to launch this smart manufacturing journey successfully? If we need to uh, change culture, then we need a strong link between the data scientists and HR to, to make the culture go in that direction. If the focus is on creating infrastructure, uh, then data scientists and IT uh, colleagues need to work together. But everything has to depend on the context and the context is owned by the OT people and, and then uh, it's not a matter of one or the other, is how you put the pieces together based on what is the priority that is uh, every company in every context is facing. Excellent. Harash, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think, well, you know, I, I'm, I've got a pet peeve around subject matter expertise, right? So Sergio is exactly right. So the, the context to solving a problem is always provided by those who know the process well, right? And when I say subject matter expertise, it includes not only the, the process expertise, but you know, somebody who's, uh, whose role is production, somebody whose role is quality, somebody whose role is infrastructure. We need to bring all those subject matter experts into that equation before we actually launch something like a machine learning and, and you know, develop that context that's important. Right? Well, you're, you're, you have both talked about context. So I, I, I think there's something more to that. And uh, so maybe you can talk to us ab about the importance of context and any other things we need to watch out when we're thinking about machine learning and manufacturing. Well, I can begin. I'm sure, sure um, uh, Sergio has, has some, some thoughts on that as well. Uh, I think what, what that means is, is that, you know, if you just have a most powerful tool at your disposal and you're feeding the wrong data into it, what you're going to get is, is not going to be meaningful, right? So it's absolutely essential that before you get on to looking at some of the modern tools that the new techniques like machine learning and AI and, uh, uh, and others are bringing in, make sure that you have your data and information in the right form. To, to feed that into, into those systems, right? So the context to me means that if you just take a temperature reading, it's not sufficient to just send that temperature reading back to an AI algorithm, right? You need to tell it that the temperature was taken on this particular piece at this particular time, at this particular location, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, so that the AI algorithm or the machine learning algorithm knows exactly what, to, you know, what that context is. So don't, don't just throw data into that data lake without thinking about it. You want to give it some dimensions so that we can pose different kind of questions to it. And, yeah. and Sergio, you, you can give you some examples actually coming from that world uh, where he has one foot in manufacturing and one foot in data science, the struggles that he may have seen if, if the data isn't in context. Yeah, and I believe that my struggle is everyone's struggle in any field where data science is applied, uh, regardless if it is manufacturing or other. In the typical life cycle of a, a data exercise, 90% uh, or so of the time and effort is sunk in doing exactly what Harash described, which is contextualizing the data. And hence, we go back to the key concept that we're discussing here, which is context. So put the data in the context such that the data represents the application and not just raw data itself. 
this is valid in all dimensions, so uh, tactical dimensions where you are, uh, you need to collect temperatures in the furnace versus the outputs that uh, are being produced by that furnace, as well as the strategic decisions that we broached upon in the earlier part of our conversation. Um, there is this expectation that 35% or so uh, of the industry are going to get 60% uh, of in 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 improvement in, in productivity. So what if we break those numbers down? Uh, is that uniform across industries or some industries will benefit more and or faster than others? So this is how you add context and bring those very fundamental questions that apply to data science or anything else. What is the why? Uh, what is the how? Uh, what is the who? And when all of those questions are answered uh, with high confidence, that means that we have enough context to address both the strategic and the tactical aspects that revolve around the application of data science into smart manufacturing. So I, I guess the, the uh, if we look at your slide that you put there, Haresh, um, obviously, um, you know, AI and machine learning, uh, advanced analytics are, are an integral part of the journey, right? So in spite of the work that has to be done, there's a value for doing it. So you guys wanna maybe touch a little bit on why you see this as a critical piece of the journey? Um, you know, the, the reason it's critical is that, you know, more and more decision-making is being done automatically. Mm -hmm. right? So you cannot uh, afford to have multiple uh, people take a look at information, make a decision, and then take that decision back to the process to make an improvement. We have the tools and the infrastructure and the computing power necessary to actually do that automatically now, right? And so more and more people are becoming dependent on doing it automatically. And therefore, we tend to, or we want to substitute the human decision-making process, the human uh, uh, ability to develop insights and make intelligent decisions back into these algorithms so that it can be done rapidly, it can be done in real time, and it can be done at scale, right? Um, and that's the reason why this has become important today, because we have the connectivity, we have the, the, the sensing capacity, we have the computing capacity, and, and that that's makes, makes a difference. Now, now, some might say, is that the goal, um, to have purely autonomous uh, processes, or is that more for thing, routine things, and we still have some things where human in the loop are also part of the machine learning equation? Uh, Sergio, what do you think? Yeah, so even to, to set the requirements that uh, need to be uh, satisfied uh, in order to claim success or to review the strategy, this is the very initial point of inception of the human in the loop, and uh, then along the chain. Uh, I think that what Haresh alluded to, uh, alluded to is more along the lines of real-time decisions that uh, happen in a time scale that is not humanly possible. There you have the support of these tools and they're going to perform better as with anything that is repetitive and can be automated in a computer, but with an important differential, which is the forward-looking element. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning they have the unique property of being predictive and in some cases even prescriptive, which means that you can uh, reasonably forecast what the future will look like and take action accordingly. And there you have kind of a convergence uh, of what typically humans will do and now machines can do as well, provided that your ecosystem has the right pieces in place. So Guys, is that a, a con? Go ahead, Mike. No, 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 no. go ahead, go ahead. You got it. No, I was just wanting to know if, if when we use the word optimization, if we're talking about a, a purely autonomous process or about, or also about these semi-autonomous processes, how, how does that link to optimization? So that will really depend on which stage of the optimization you are uh, in terms of the life cycle of optimization. The formulation of the optimization procedure, which is typically where things make or break, that is up to the humans and to the subject matter experts more so, and I wanted to make this link very clear to what Haresh highlighted before. The subject matter experts are in the unique position of really formulating an optimization problem that makes sense given the context. Now, the solution of an optimization problem, then you leave it to the algorithms, because when you have multidimensional input in space, 
and multidimensional decision space, that means that uh, uh, it's humanly impossible to really face this, these algorithms and, and compete against them because they are made to operate in a number of dimensions that, that humans are simply not designed to, at least at our current evolutionary stage. Um, I, I'm going to go a little off script here, guys, for a second. We had a question pop up in the Q&A, um, uh, which I think is worth asking at this point. And I'll just say, too, that um, uh, we have plenty of stuff to talk about here, and we're going to uh, continue on and have another session afterwards go uh, uh, with some bonus reel to go to continue the conversations more deeply. But uh, the question that was, uh, was raised is, given your experiences, uh, do organizations fully understand the benefits of implementing AI or machine learning, or are they still questioning the business impact and the benefits of this technology? I, I, can, uh, I can provide one perspective. Um, I, I think there is, there is buy-in at different levels uh, in the organization, but it's, um, it's important to know that, that we understand what it is being used for. So, so one of the tendencies with any new technologies is that you know somebody hears about it on a golf course and comes back to the company and says that we want to do it as well because my buddy is doing it or you know another company is doing it. That's not necessarily the right approach, right? You have to do it for the right reasons. So, so start asking the question that is this relevant for me? And if it is relevant for me, at what levels in the organization I need to start socializing it? and then work with the technology teams to actually implement it. So some of that, that fear is beginning to go away now because more and more manufacturers are actually showing you examples of machine learning and AI being used, right? Um, but it's just taking off, right? So I think there are, there are people still on the fence that are watching, depending on the size of the organization, whether this is relevant for me to use now or should I wait another three, four years to do it? So that would be my perspective. Yeah, and I agree with Haresh's take that there has been progress uh, and, and that is really noticeable. Uh, let me just add on top to that, focusing perhaps a little bit on the challenges. So the, the challenges is that there is lack of specificity. The, the belief is increasing and the buy-in is increasing, but how does that translate to really hitting the bottom line and creating ROI, which is what uh, uh, decision makers are, are effectively interested at. And in order to get that specificity, uh, from my experience, the, the, the big game changer is to perhaps implement things in a piecewise fashion at bite sizes that we can manage, but to always have the big picture formulated up front. Don't even give the first step of your journey if you don't have a good enough outline of what the big picture will be. And then decide to slice and dice that according to your resources and your uh, appetite to go faster or slower. Excellent. Well, appreciate that. And um, as we talked about, the time here goes very quickly. Uh, I know we want to talk more about uh, some, some mega trends, um, open source scaling, um, you know, making these technologies available to the masses. So we will take those conversations over to our bonus reel and, and try to, to wrap this up now. We'll also let everybody know to expect that in the coming weeks, you'll see an announcement for um, Haresh hosting Sergio back uh, in a tech talk format to go much deeper uh, in a longer, longer format. But gentlemen here, um, as we go to close, we like to let our guests give us one takeaway for the audience here as far as you know, what does smart manufacturing look like and with regard to machine learning. So Sergio, you wanna give your, your perspective? Yeah, sure, Mike. Uh, we're fortunate as uh, people in the manufacturing industry to be able to harvest a lot of good knowledge that exists in many fields. The very underpinnings of AI and machine learning for manufacturing, they exist uh, with very subtle changes in diverse fields, uh, ranging from healthcare to retail. So, uh, Go there and harvest that. You can create a lot of momentum for free and further improve your ROI. Yeah, for me, Mike, it's, it's going to be subject matter expertise. Don't forget it. Don't lose it because you may automate your decision making, but how that decision is being made within the algorithms and the data that you're feeding it is all dependent on your subject matter expertise. So don't forget that. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate you, gentlemen, for being here. Um, would encourage everybody to stay connected with Sesame. 
um, with this series. And uh, we are going to take these, uh, th this recording here, we will post it online um, and we will post uh, discussions in our LinkedIn group. So we would encourage everybody to stay connected with us from that perspective. Uh, and and shoot us an email, um, connect with us if you have ideas for speakers, if you yourself want to be here, if you have topics that you want to raise, because we want as many voices as we can in this discussion. And uh, stay tuned uh, for our upcoming shows. We've got some exciting shows and, and guests coming up. Uh, our, our next one will be on on how engineering programs are evolving at institutions like uh, Purdue University. Uh, so that to enable more innovation in manufacturing that is cross-discipline. It's a very interesting topic. And we also want to be talking to you about the truth about smart manufacturing. <laughs> the truth. <laughs> what, what does it really mean? How can we tell we're on the right path? So that will be another interesting upcoming uh, episode. All right. So with that, we thank everybody and uh, wish you have a, a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.